And then the last partner is the Water Institute of the Gulf. And Scott, if you just want to say a, a few quick words. Sure. The water, um, I'm Scott Hemmerling, the Director of Human Dimensions with the Water Institute of the Gulf. We're a nonprofit research institution located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We know a lot of you through some of our modeling work that we do down in the coast, but we also have a human dimensions team, which leads a lot of our stakeholder engagement that we do in the community. So we're working with the project, trying to bring the community together with, with the group we see here. So thanks everyone for being here. Okay, so um, uh, just a little bit about how the COAST program came about. With the support of BHP, the three groups got together to start COAST. Um, and what we're really looking to do is connect um, native coastal communities in Lafourche and Tarabone to coastal leaders, scientists, project managers, um, to think about um, the challenges and opportunities that these communities face and to look at community resilience kind of um, holistically um, and really bring the community ideas back um, back to the state and think about how they fit into um, the master plan. And so let's see, next slide. You ready yet? <laughs> I see him. Hello, Garrett Graves, Congressman for the 6th District of Louisiana. It's good to see your face. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good, good. Um, welcome to, you just heard a little introduction about the program that we're working here with our partners at Louisiana Sea Grant and the Water Institute of the Gulf. Um, Restore Retreat has been working with them for about three years on this project that focuses in on Lafourche and Terrebonne. And so I know you love that part of the world. So <laughs> we wanted to ask you on um, today to talk to folks today, but in particular address you've been a real champion on fisheries issues. And so we wanted you to speak directly to them. We have about 23 people on the line right now, but we're also recording this to share as well. So we just, we know that you're working hard up there and we wanted you to share some of what you're working on. Yeah, sure. Um, well, hey, thanks. Uh, appreciate uh, Restore Retreat uh, hosting this thing. It's good to see uh, so many familiar faces. Uh, Twilly, hope you're doing okay over there. Uh, good to see you. Um, but, 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 but hey, um, so, so first, just to kind of take a, a, a big step back, um, it's been really great seeing what, what seems to be this evolution of kind of recognizing that doing ecological restoration is not just some crazy wild investment that doesn't have uh, monetary benefits or doesn't bring benefits to, to adjacent communities. And, and, I, and I really believe that at the Obviously, at the state level, I think the state's doing doing really well. Chip's been great to work with, um, but at the federal level, you're seeing a lot more recognition and investment just in ecological resilience as as part of the uh, kind of partnership or or in tandem with community resilience. And and so at the federal level, uh, one we we were able to uh, to extend the. Uh, funding source for the Coastal Wetlands Planning Protection Restoration <laughs> Act program too. Um, we've been able to finally get some dollars flowing through the, um, uh, the, the GOMESA, the Offshore Energy Revenue Sharing Program. Number three, and this one, I want to just give me a minute to, to make the connection here. Uh, we've been able to secure about $3 billion in funding, in, in addition to what I just talked about, in funding for a lot of the Corps of Engineer flood control projects. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, we're talking about ecological restoration. Why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Uh, because we have, if, if nationally, there are about $100 billion worth of authorized projects for the Corps of Engineers, $100 billion, nearly one-third of them are at home. One third. So the other 49 states get the, the other two thirds. We have one third. So if we're able to secure funding to address that backlog of projects in other Corps of Engineer spaces, it allows us to focus the remaining dollars on those priorities that pertain to restoration, ecological restoration, uh, largely under this umbrella of the Louisiana coastal area. Uh, program. So, um, so, so that's been a good, uh, a good hit as well. Um, uh, so, so we're making some progress there. Now, one thing that's 
I don't know. It's 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 kind of a, a thing that makes uh, many of us lose our lose our temper a little bit. But there is a bill moving through the Congress right now. It's already passed out of the House that would excuse me already passed out of the Senate that would take hundreds of millions of dollars of our annually of our offshore uh, energy revenues, and it would um, uh, contribute that toward conservation efforts, land conservation efforts in other states. Uh, which, look, to be clear, I, I fully support land conservation and acquiring land for national parks and wildlife refuges and BLM and all those things. There have been years where I have literally spent, spent more nights outdoors in those areas than I've spent indoors. Um, but if you are robbing our revenue stream from our area for the purpose of conservation, yet you're refusing to conserve our very area, I just, I think it's wrong. And so we've been fighting that one and I'll, I'll admit it's gonna be really hard. The bill's got a lot of momentum, but we're trying to extract um, uh, some concessions there or, or see what we can do to make some improvements to, to that bill that, that came over with a strong voting margin from the, from the Senate. Um, next thing is uh, we, we enacted a bill called the Disaster uh, Recovery uh, Reform Act um, and DARA and that bill, what it did is, it, it, I think for the first time, it recognized that we can't continue coming in disaster after disaster and spending billions and billions of dollars in the aftermath of a disaster. And instead, we need to really flip this paradigm over and begin being proactive with investment on the front end, preventing disasters from, from ultimately happening. And so um, that legislation, I really think, is just going to be foundational in terms of this transition from a reactionary approach to a proactive approach. It does include investment in, in for the first time ever, defining the term resilience um, and uh, an adaptation to where we can make investments in community and in ecological resilience uh, projects in an effort. And we dedicated funding to it, too. It's not just uh, uh, saying, hey, here's the policy. We actually dedicated annual funding to, to some of these efforts uh, to make sure that, um, that, that, that we, could, we could make some progress there. Um, so um, I, guess, I guess last and, and really the, the, the crux, I think, of what Simone laid out is, um, is, is, is tying this back with fisheries. And I just want to be very clear that, that every time that I've talked about um, this, this ecological resilience, that is the habitat that, that, that produces and, and Twilly or somebody else can correct me, but I think, it, what is it, uh, Robert, 92% of all the species in the Gulf of Mexico are dependent upon uh, our coastal wetlands. Over 90% of all the freshwater inputs into the Gulf of Mexico flow in through Louisiana, creating this unique productive estuary um, that really benefits all five Gulf states and, of course, all of the species there. So as we move forward with ecological resilience and, and, and move forward with these projects to sustain coastal Louisiana, it really is about sustaining the Gulf and the productivity uh, that's, uh, that, that's there as well. Um, we, um, well, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll stop there and, um, and, and, and see if you all have uh, questions um, as, I'm, as I'm thinking before I, I turn it over, Simone. Let me just make note that um, on July 15th, uh, which I believe is a Wednesday, we are marking up the uh, Water Resources Development Act, which is the, which markup means a committee vote with amendments and everything else. So that's happening on Wednesday, July 15th. Um, that is the legislation that addresses all of the Corps of Engineers policies, laws, projects, and everything else. So we're working on a number of improvements uh, there to Corps of Engineers policy, building upon some of the things that we've done in the 2016 and 2018 legislation to help us implement uh, many of these backlogged restoration projects that um, honestly have just been around for way too long without enough action. So. Yeah, thank you, Garrett. In the past, that word of bill has been critical to Terrebonne and Lafourche, right? And, and getting the right authorizations in there. So I'm glad that y'all are back on track to doing those every two, year, <laughs> two years, right? Not, not since you got there did they start getting back on track for the two years. Um, we did ask folks to put some questions in the chat and you did such a good job that nobody has any. But it looks like Dr. Twilley might be thinking about something. You got any questions of your He's congressman? Cor correct my stats, uh, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess, I mean, you know, the big question is, um, you know, trying to get through this COVID 
um, supply chain issues, and it's a it's a struggle. There's just a lot of pain out there, and so I, uh, you know, I and I'm sure there's a lot of effort going on up in in D.C. How do you see? You know, it's very interesting this discussion of how how uh, programs and policies um, are are associated with volume of seafood, which would benefit. We're 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 tops in the nation in volume of seafood, but then but then they actually start rewarding money based on quality of seafood. And, and all of a sudden, you know, our ranking uh, starts to change. But, but you could argue that the volume is actually uh, that's uh, workforce. You know, that when you talk about volume of seafood that from our estuaries, which is the most productive estuary in the, in the United States, therefore we do 98 million pounds of shrimp. Nobody t- touches that, but it doesn't have the same quality. So, you know, I think that's one of the issues and tough parts of policy is, you know, trying to find those right formulas up in Washington that really represent our needs down in this rich Delta. All right, trying to unmute there. Um, so you're, you're exactly right. And of course, the, the fishing community has just been pounded in recent years with one, of course, the, you know, Katrina, Rita, Gustav Ike. Um, Isaac, uh, number two, uh, have been pounded with uh, these imports that have been subsidized, have been dumped on, dumped on our markets, um, unfair trade practices that, that have uh, really wreaked havoc um, on, on our fishing community, just compounding the problem, of course, uh, the, the deluge of fresh water and reminding all of you that we drain from Montana to New York to Canada and in, down the Mississippi River system and, I, and, and, I, and it's virtually none of that water in that system is actually coming from us. Um, I, I believe I read something the other day that says that uh, I think it's just under 1% of the water is actually from the state of Mississippi. Um, and so we're, 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 we're bearing this brunt of the nation, yet it, again, all the impacts are on us. And so we were able to secure $14 million through one program and $58 million through another program to invest in our fishing communities uh, to help um, sustain those that have just taken a pounding through all of these different things. We're continuing to work on trade policy and then trying to enforce fair trade practices. We have been working during COVID with the Department of Agriculture to purchase shrimp and they did commit to purchase 20 million pounds. They had this fight over five pound bags versus two pound bags. Now they came back and said, well, we're not sure that might be a luxury item, but then I think that I just saw that they're trying to offer assistance to lobster men or women. So shrimp is luxury and lobster is, so um, this isn't over. Um, we're, we're obviously continuing to work to, to, to try and get those investments in the, in the product uh, in Louisiana that as you mentioned, we, um, we bring in more than, more than anyone by far in regard to, to, to shrimp. And so um, continue to work on that and actually working on some crawfish, uh, trying to work on some crawfish things as well, so. Thank you, Mon, I'd, just like, I'd just like to say that uh, this issue of, of, of quantity versus quality, I'll, I'll put Louisiana seafood as far as quality goes up against any seafood in the, oh, yeah. the country. It, it may not cost as much, so the value may not be as high, but the quality is there. So, um, Garrett, there's no more uh, chat, uh, no more questions in the chat, and so we don't want to hold you from your important business today, but I did see, I saw that you have Paul on the phone, David, Dustin. If, if our folks have questions, would you mind if we referred them to your office directly, or um, we can make that connection between the work that you're doing uh, and some of the staffers that are working really hard in those offices. Is that okay? Partners. And I know going through that, that He's Never. telling me yes. <laughs> I know he is. <laughs> that, that's fine with me, Simone. Uh, thank you, Dustin. <laughs> I appreciate that. We do appreciate the congressman's time, too. So um, with that, please, if you have any more questions, please uh, you can include it in the chat. I know that Jesse's talked to quite a few folks directly, too, so you can send questions to Jesse. Wait. Um, and thank you. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to get to that office, we do appreciate Congressman Graves' time and extra effort in D.C. Uh, fighting for us here along Louisiana's coast. So um, Dr. Twilley and, and I know Thomas email, <laughs> that's a joke from, uh, <laughs> I'll make him tell you the email joke. Um, 
but we have them on the line because we want to talk about some important work and programs of Louisiana Sea Grant and one in particular. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim. To So Jim's on this side of me. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Jim to introduce Robert, who's on this side of me. Um, and we'll, we'll introduce the uh, Louisiana Sea Grant program and its director. Jim, take it away. Yeah, uh, Dr. Robert Twilley is the director of Louisiana uh, Sea Grant College program, which is housed at LSU. I believe you've been there, what, six years now, Robert? Is that correct? Uh, I've been at LSU since 2004. Well, I'm, I'm, as far as uh, director of uh, uh, yeah, 2012, so eight years now. Eight years. Okay, so it's time Time flies and you're having fun. Yeah, right? it does, you know. <laughs> so Robert is also a uh, renowned coastal ecologist exactly. with uh, decades of experience in uh, coastal processes and uh, coastal restoration. And so uh, when it comes to that area, he, He's, he's the man to go to, so go ahead, Robert. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and just talk a little bit about Sea Grant. You can go to the next slide. And I, I like using this slide. I know it's a little busy. Um, but the idea here is that simply decision makers and managers and stakeholders, you know, Sea Grant works under the, the sort of mission that, the, that you know, decisions really are improved the more they're informed by scientific knowledge. And, um, and so we have this sort of motto, Sea Grant is connecting university content to serve coastal communities. And I, you know, I, some people may not realize this, but you know, um, from the perspective of being a faculty member at a, at a public university, I really do consider myself a public servant. And so our idea is to sort of help uh, build by which technical knowledge from our universities that are down here on the bottom um, gets passed up to decision makers and uh, you see that sort of arrow pointing in that direction but I want to I want to highlight the other arrow the one to the right and that is you know we have through our extension service and through our work at Sea Grant it's really important that we listen it's not just that we talk relative to what knowledge is coming out of our, our universities, but we listen to the problems that communities are having and we, we, we put, we, we, we absorb that information and try to transform it into new research projects and new knowledge that goes back to the community. So, so we, we really, this idea of service and I call it the value proposition of getting our research universities engaged in the issues of our coastal communities. And so that's, and we serve all the universities. We are Louisiana Sea Grant at LSU. So we, we work with our universities across the coast. And next slide. Um, and we do this in four different areas. Uh, we have healthy coastal ecosystems as one of our focus areas, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, resilient communities and economies, and education and workforce development. So uh, these are all four areas that we work in. Today we're going to talk and focus on sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. But as you just heard from Congressman Graves, I think it's a really great statement that he made that, you know, resilient communities are linked to resilient ecosystems and, and therefore those also produce productive fisheries, which keeps our communities whole. We do this through an extension program. I like using this little diagram where we generate knowledge is sort of in that blue color, but transferring it to communities and facilitating it you know, that's the intense interaction and that's our extension program. We have nine offices across the state and we have these great group of extension personnel. You see these pictures. Uh, we could not do this without the uh, collaboration with the LSU Ag Center. Um, these, in fact, nearly all of our extension agents are half-time Ag Center employees and 50% and, uh, time Sea Grant. So this is the reason we're able to, to be so effective in our communities because we live there. And, and this, this, is, this is the value of an extension service. And next slide, I think that's my last one, and turn it over to Thomas. But this program that Thomas is going to talk about is, is really, I think, representative of, of us not only providing knowledge to our communities, but listening to our communities and coming up with some ideas of how to help build a more sustainable uh, fisheries. So Thomas, it's all yours. 
Um, Thomas, before you start, I did see Congressman Graves dial back in. So um, I think he, he wanted to comment on, on Jim's seafood comment and close it out for us. So uh, welcome hey, back. Sorry, to you. sorry about that. I'm on a, on a wired connection now. Um, uh, just want to say uh, thank you all very much. I, I apologize that, uh, that, that the connection lost, but uh, in, in response to uh, Jim's, Jim's comments about quality seafood, I, I agree with you. I, I, I put it up against absolutely anyone's. Um, and it's why we're fighting some of these uh, trade policies, trying to ensure that we don't have illegal, that we don't have uh, illegal in terms of dumped or subsidized, that we don't have illegal in terms of chemicals or disease, uh, antibiotics and other things that are used in these farmed uh, seafood products coming to the United States and, um, and, and fully believe in the, in the quality of our product if given a chance to fairly go head to head with some of these imports. So, but thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you for Garrett. Thank you for being on again. Thank you for your work that you're doing in DC for us here in Louisiana. So we appreciate that very much. Um, so Mr. Email, <laughs> now you really have to start with that story, right Thomas? <laughs> I'll be the one advancing your slide. So you just let me know after your email story um, when you want me to move to the next slide, okay? Yep, Thomas, you gotta unmute yourself. I tried to and I can on this end, but there you go. Thank you. All right, hello everybody out there. I know a lot of you, but uh, thanks for the invitation to be here with you today. And so my last name is, is email spelled H-Y-M-E-L. So one time I was uh, interviewed by a young writer here at the local, at the local uh, Daily Iberian and she put, uh, she, she did a story and my last name was spelled E-M-A-I-L. So, <laughs> but if you're a South Louisiana person from around White Castle, email spelled H-Y-M-E-L or H-I-M-E-L, it's, it's the same people. So all the emails are related, we're from South Louisiana. So uh, anyway, so let me get, get started. Uh, so we're going to dive into seafood. I love to talk about seafood, and I've been here with the uh, Ag Center and Sea Grant for the past 35 years, so it's uh, been a long time, and, and I love it. I love working in the field. I'm a project person. Uh, I've worked with, uh, uh, I work with all the various fisheries. I've worked in the processing plants. Uh, I've done a lot of things over, over my time here, and just getting more and more excited. Next slide. Next slide. Are you locked up? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so we've got a lot back up. We've got a lot going up. We got a lot going on. Uh, in us, us being Ag Center and Sea Grant colleagues uh, that we work with, our team at LSU uh, in, in food science and in. Uh, legal and, and all, we've got a really a robust program here in Louisiana. We are the number two seafood state in the nation, only after Alaska, so we've got it going on. We've also, I, I, I'd venture to say that we have some of the strongest outreach programs for seafood uh, th than any of the other Gulf states or maybe in the country as well, but they, the other states look at the things that we're doing and, and, and try to keep up, uh, or watch us, and, and we work together with them to help them do what we're doing. But we run two major programs. Uh, we, we run two major programs uh, that we've been able to get outside uh, grant money for to help us really boost what we do uh, in the state. One is called the Louisiana Fisheries Forward Program, LFF, where we're a partner with uh, the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries to help develop uh, a bunch of outreach. And I'll show you later the website where you can go and see all the many industry uh, fact sheets and videos that we've produced over the last eight years with that project. And then also we'll go into Louisiana Direct Seafood, which is all about uh, marketing and developing products. Next slide. So uh, the coast is vast. There's uh, lots of folks out there and we love to work with them. Uh, uh, we get contacted all kinds of ways. We find them, they find us, but usually it's somebody with an idea. They want to bring it to the next level, and we help them get to that point. So we're uh, 
that, that's really where we do our focus. Next. Next slide. So we have a program called Louisiana Direct Seafood, which was created right, uh, oh, maybe 10 years ago, where we started with working with the Port of Delcom to help uh, do direct marketing. And it was at a time when the, the prices for shrimp from imports uh, had driven, driven local prices down, where fishermen in the Port of Delcom were having a hard time even keeping their boats afloat. So. Uh, we created a direct marketing program there with the community of develop uh, of Delcom that just has has rolled since since that time and, and, and it's a really interesting story. But next, so it used to be that in Delcom it was illegal to sell across the docks there just because of the politics of the town. But that was all changed with the Delcom Direct Seafood Program, and uh, and it, it we, we had a website we. We now, when a boat comes into Delcom, the folks are lined up just like you see in this picture, and it's on and on and on. This has been going on for years like this. Next slide. We also have in Delcom now a uh, we got some hurricane recovery money, uh, uh, some Rita uh, hurricane Rita money, uh, and we're able to build a facility in Delcom where we have a seafood farmers market. This is in partnership with the Port of Delcom, but on the first Saturday of of the month, uh, not during the COVID times, but but all prior and will be to come. We have thousands of people come to Delcom to the facility there. It's a big, beautiful place on on the waterfront. It's a pavilion, a huge parking lot, a farmers market, a seafood farmers market. Boats can back up and sell direct off in the docks, and and the boats are getting at least double what uh, they would get selling. Uh, at the at the docks at, at, uh, and through the wholesale channels. Next slide. So when we took the Delcom project and we spread it out across the state, and that's called Louisiana Direct Seafood, which allows commercial fishermen to be able to sell to the public if they have an interest. It's a free project. There's the, there's a, we start over in Cameron with the Cameron Direct project, and in Delcom, uh, uh, Lafouche. I'm sorry. Uh, Vermilion, St. Mary, and Iberia Parish, uh, that's Delcom Direct Seafood. Then we have uh, another component uh, project in Lafouche Terrebonne called La Terre Direct Seafood. And then around the New Orleans area, we have South Shore Direct Seafood. So these are all programs and projects where fishermen from those areas or people that have uh, products to sell that can get engaged in that. This is primarily direct marketing, direct from the boat, uh, boat to table. Next slide. And so the farmer's market has really become a big deal. It is really uh, attracts a lot of people to Delcom, which was not a real nice place in years past, but it really has upgraded and property values have gone up on the waterfront. And now it's just a really nice place to come and visit and be. So we're really proud of everything that's happened there. Next. And then uh, we do outreach programs across the state. So you know, shrimper meetings, crabber meetings, oyster meetings, all those kinds of things. And every two years, and we just held on the last day you could hold a meeting, we held our 2020 summit at the Pontchartrain Center. And it's a really exciting meeting with uh, all the information that you, uh, all the biologists, and it's a trade show and an educational program. We do it every two years and hope we get to do it uh, two more years from now. But uh, it's a great place where the Louisiana seafood industry can come together and meet and learn and share. And it, it's, a, uh, an incredible, uh, it's an incredible day uh, and really worth attending. Next. So when you go there, the place is full of people, uh, with a lot of things to see, a lot of equipment, vendors, talks, good seafood to eat. Just a great day for the seafood industry. It's rare to get uh, fishermen together. They don't like going to meetings. Uh, and I don't either, but uh, we get a good turnout at, at this event. Next. And also part of that, uh, we do a seafood processing training and demonstration called Beyond the Boat to help teach people that want to be able to take and pack and process and do something with their product other than just sell it uh, right outright all these different things that you can do. So uh, we have a whole program based around that and I'll get in that in a little bit. So next. 
as I mentioned, local meetings, uh, crab, shrimp, oysters. We go all across the coast from Cameron to, to, uh, to Venice, to uh, St. Bernard Parish, uh, everywhere. We're all over the whole state with our marine extension program, uh, partnering together and putting these meetings together to help our industry uh, remain economically sustainable. Next. We also interact with the culinary world. There's a lot that uh, a lot of folk, a lot of things that uh, folks in that sector don't know about seafood. We're trying to bridge that uh, information gap, but uh, that's where most of the seafood is sold in the restaurants. And and so we've we've done a bunch of programs like that, interacting with culinary world. Next, and and on and on. This is at the summit where we had chefs cooking, demonstrating different things that you can do with new and novel things you can do with seafood. Next. Now this is really an exciting area. We call it microprocessing. So this is where we say micro, so small mom and pop processing plants where folks that are interested in packing their own shrimp or packing uh, oysters, crab, whatever it is, uh, we work with them uh, to be able to help them get through the process because it's there's a lot of regulations, there's a lot of permitting, there's a lot of things to know to, to be able to get a pack out into the marketplace, but this is where a lot of the innovation is happening with these small processors, getting that really high quality boutique type gourmet seafood uh, to, to, the, uh, to the consumers. And so, next slide. And so, uh, we, we bring these products out, we show them, we work with the with producers, we get them in front of the public, let, let them meet people, learn how to sell things. Uh, we teach them a lot in these kinds of events, food shows, next. Yeah. And, and, and so the products that are created, uh, they're, they're we, everywhere we can go to, uh, any place we can go to show them off, uh, uh, like food shows, uh, uh, seafood mar uh, farmers markets, those kinds of things, we'll be at those kind of events showing these products. But these are the best of the best of local seafood, next. And so it's, it's all about uh, you know, value-added seafood, and it's a, there's a lot of opportunity here. It's happening, and I'm going to go through a few slides here to show you some of the packs. Next slide. So Vermilion Bay Suite was a local brand that was created by the Port of Delcom in partnership with uh, Sea Grant Ag Center. And uh, this was our, the first product that rolled out into the marketplace, and this is a gourmet pack that retails for $19 a pound. A 2630 hand peeled Duvain shrimp. Next. And uh, it was rolled out in Delcom at a little local specialty uh, meat market there. Next. And different places around just to get the word out. There's a lot to getting a new product into the marketplace to be able to differentiate what you have from everything else. Next. And so we create literature, flyers, all those kinds, professional things to help uh, to help make it happen. Now, mind you, we didn't know how to do this before we did it. So it's like we, we learned as we went. Next. It created a whole series of Vermilion Bay Sweet brands that are uh, product forms that are out there. Black drum, white shrimp, uh, oysters, blue crabs, catfish. There's more than, than what you see there. Next. And, uh, and and on and on and on. So putting a nice putting a uh, putting a product and most of the things that we're that are sold via uh, uh, microprocessor are frozen things so that they can be sh uh, stored and, sh and sold in the off season. So it's amazing how much product moves during the holidays and also during Lent when there's not a lot of things being caught. Next. And on, so off we go to the port and the port's partners out uh, showing off all the seafood packs next. And then we take, uh, for, for example, it's like a lot of people come to Delcom to buy, uh, to buy shrimp right off of the boat, which is a big, big draw there, but next. But a lot of want to, people want to process that. So how do you do that? And, and what, is it, what are the requirements? And so we have literature on that, information, experience, what it takes, but something of the size of a garage, you can, it's amazing what you can do. You have to work with your parish sanitarian and, and, and follow the guidelines, but it can certainly be done. And there's lots of facilities like this across the coast. Next. 
in different equipments that you use here, a vacuum pack machine and a shrimp uh, splitter that'll devein it next. And just all those different shapes, sizes, buildings that people use that they, they set up to be able to process seafood. So I'm speaking to Lafouche Terrebonne here, but that's where a lot of these pictures are from. So for the ideas of things that can happen down there, there's endless opportunities with uh, developing packaging seafood. Next. You might know this guy from uh, down in Bayou de Large. He took a, uh, this is uh, uh, Captain Quincy Verrett. He took a, uh, an insulated uh, container and turned it into a processing plant and it's beautiful inside. And he's, he's all excited. He has two shrimp boats, but he's got captains on him now. And he's running his little processing plant and taking orders and he's doing well with it. Next. This is his white shrimp pack, next. And he does, uh, he catches and, uh, uh, and processes and freezes sheep's head uh, and sells a lot of those fillets, next. Turtle, I mean, you name it, this guy does it. He knows it all. He's, 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 as, he's as Cajun as you can get, uh, <laughs> next. Squid, you know, we got squid here. A lot of people didn't know that, but this is a lot of, a lot of folks like this. It's used for bait, but there's a lot more of it's eaten uh, uh, as a delicacy than is used for bait. Next. And this is, uh, this is Brian, uh, Brian down at uh, Karina Seafood. Brian, oh, losing my mind. Anyway, he's got a uh, Karina Karina Seafood. He's a shrimp boat owner that that started shucking oysters and started packing his own shrimp. And he's right there on the highway uh, in Golden Meadow, Brian Mobley and his wife, Karina. Next. And so he does a vacuum packed oyster and he's just, uh, he can't keep up with them. That is just, this, it goes flat in the freezer. It keeps forever. And uh, in each one pound bag is about 24 big fat oysters packed in the peak of season. Next. And when you cook them, this is a frozen oyster that's thawed out, doing a nice little saute uh, to go with pasta. Next. And here, hand, uh, here is some machine, uh, some, some shrimp that's been split and deveined and packed in a tray. This was being sold at the time at Cajun Grocer, shipped around the country. Next. Then here we got Douglas Olander in uh, St. Mary Parish, Big D Seafood, and his dream was to pack his own his own black drum fillets and sell them. Next. He and his group catch about a million pounds of this fish in a normal year, but they normally have been selling it like this. Ice down in a box goes to, goes to New Orleans How fish cutters there where it's then uh, recirculated back to the same restaurants in this area. Next. But he wanted to cut that fish and do his own pack, so we worked with him to do it. Next. And there you got Vermilion Bay Sweet Black Drum, and he can't keep this in his freezer. It just, he packs it and it's gone, packs and it's gone. But this was, uh, then next, something that you're gonna start seeing more of, whole cooked frozen crabs, just like you would buy uh, king crabs or Dungeness crabs, they're all, they're all been cooked to freeze. We're doing the same thing now with uh, blue crabs. So those blue, blue crabs that we ship up to the Northeast, uh, by the truck load, by the tractor trailer load, some of those now are going to be cooked and frozen as a value added product where you can throw them in your freezer. You want to do a crab boil, you just take out a couple of dozen and you throw them in the seasoned water. And trust me, they're as good as, as a crab that you just caught. Next. And then frog legs and other things. And all the seafood that we have further north the buffalo, the gar, the, the goo, uh, and, and those species the Asian carps, next. And this is a little processing plant in, in, in Lauraville that does uh, catfish and frog legs and all those kinds of things in season, next. And then we've got boats now that are uh, out catching red snapper. This is uh, Anna Marie Shrimp in Montague. He's got a boat that does shrimp and a boat that does gulf fish, next. So snapper, grouper, those kinds of things are things you, you don't, it's hard to find local Louisiana product because it all gets shipped out. And we're trying, this is backfin lump crab meat, jumbo lump. So this is, 
this is new kinds of packaging that we're trying that we're doing and working to come up with more modern things that we can do here in the state to get more value and longer shelf life for fresh and frozen products. Next. Uh, more crab meat. This is a uh, back fin lump. Next. Then claw meat. Claw meat packed a different way. And claws, the fingers packed another way. Next. And then crab cakes. We've got a guy that's making these most delicious crab cakes. He has a crab picking plant and he makes his he makes his crab cakes right with uh, meat right off the line that hadn't gotten cold yet. Next. And then something we're doing with uh, with uh, freezing shrimp on the boat. This is not IQF uh, brine frozen, but this is plate frozen. Uh, we work with industry to create a brand uh, uh, called Louisiana Limited Wild Plate Frozen. This is the absolute premium uh, whole shrimp that's available out there in the market now. This stuff is incredible. If you thaw it out, it looks like it came out of a cast net. All the legs and whiskers and all remain on it. Next. And so this is what it looks like thawed out. Uh, just incredible. Next. And this is just a marketing picture that we took uh, of the wild plate frozen. There's several producers in the state that are that are putting this up, and it's uh, you're usually getting uh, two to three dollars a pound uh, premium above other product forms for a whole shrimp like this. Next. They're done in a plate freezer on a boat or in a plate freezer on a dock. Next. Uh, here's at Brian Mobley's in Galliano. He's got a big one. He's freezing them there and it's planned off a day boat shrimp or night boat shrimp in his case. Next. This is his product, a 20 pound box and he ships them out. People come and buy them. He can't keep them. Next. And this is what that product looks like when you go to a food show and you do samples and all. It's just a beautiful whole shrimp, great presentation, great for barbecue shrimp in a, in a situation where a chef wants to show a whole shrimp. Next. And so these stories of the products that we're working with have showed up in Kitchen and Culture and many other magazines and stories and books and all. So the things we're doing in Louisiana here are really catching on. Next. Tuna. I mean, you know, we get a lot, we land a lot of tuna here in Louisiana, and this is this is actually a Jensen tunas in in Homa. Uh, next, but you rarely see uh, this product form a vacuum pack frozen tuna uh, piece uh, uh, from Yellowfin Gulf tuna. Most of what you'll see in the grocery stores around is Viet Vietnamese or or some other country source, but. Uh, We've now got yellowfin, Gulf yellowfin tuna being sold, packed like this in places now. So I hope to grow that. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank the people that, uh, that are bringing that in and working with us. Next. And, and on and on. This is just a, some seared tuna. Next. And then wild catfish. Wild catfish is an is a underutilized species in this state. Everybody loves it. There's a lot of growth opportunity. Next. We packed it under uh, vermilion Bay sweet with the uh, with and this is being sold around the country right now uh, via e-commerce and I'll get to that in a minute. Next, Pompano. There's so many things out here that in our state that you never see in a grocery store, but this is this is just an incredible fish that freezes well. Next, vermilion snapper, uh, yellow edge grouper, other different things that we're what you see in pack now in, in a consumer pack. Next. Even fish heads sell. Every, every bit of the fish uh, has got a market for it. If somebody wants these beautiful red heads, they put them in soups uh, and, and stocks and those kind of things. Next. Soft shell crabs. You, every soft shell crab has 10 homes. Next. Can't produce enough of them. We're working to help get, uh, help folks produce more of them, but this is this is a high, very high value luxury item. Next. And garfish, I mean, who eats gar anymore? But let me tell you what, it's getting another look at. This is gar, a white, a nice, beautiful white fish. Next. You slice it, this is what it looks like. Next. You saute it in a, in a nice little batter, and this is what you got with a, a cream sauce. Boom, it's just really good. Next. Uh, 
And then this is hand peeling, hand to vein shrimp, which is a pack that's out there now next. This is Anna Marie shrimp. He has, he has a little processing plant and he's shipping pellets of this uh, to different customers around the country, but they love this. This uh, It's not machine peeled, it's hand peeled. So you have all the flavor uh, uh, and, and the texture because there's nothing else added to the flesh. Next. And just a few more slides, guys, but I just wanted to show you all the stuff that's going on out there. So these are pre-shucked and frozen oysters. You can buy them in a box that has 144 of them, 12 dozens, and you pull them out frozen and you put them on the pit and you char gr or grill them just like that. Next. These are done at Wilson's Oysters in, uh, uh, in Homa. Next slide. So you can, you, this, you open the boxes, what they look like. Next. And then you can produce this on your pit at home without shucking an oyster. It's already done. Next. And so I uh, love working with these guys. This is on a television program in New Orleans. We're showing off Brian Mobley shrimp and we did a, and his oyster products. And we did, we cooked some, we cooked a dish there on television. It was great fun. Next. We go to food shows. This is uh, in New Orleans at the Convention Center uh, at, the, at the Louisiana Restaurant Association uh, trade show. Next. And we're selling this in different places. This is at a local farmer's market. Uh, the Louisiana Direct Seafood has a freezer there with a variety of these products. Next. And then we just kicked off recently a, uh, an e-commerce program called Louisiana Direct Seafood Shop, where a lot of the products that I've showed you here uh, uh, are, are now being sold all around the country. Uh, the governor pointed out this program in one of his press conferences encouraging people to eat local Louisiana seafood, and boom, it just exploded. So it's, uh, uh, so it's being shipped. Uh, all around the country, but it's coming from all these small mom and pop processors across the coast. Next. Next. And so lots of stories about the things that we're doing. We are, uh, we are, our, our Sea Grant work was, uh, was captured in a, in, a, in a seafood edition of Louisiana Agriculture, a bunch of great stories about the science behind seafood processing uh, with the, all our team members involved. Next. And we have a seafood quality training lab that we drag around to our different meetings to teach people how to do plate frozen, brine frozen, chilled shrimp, all those kinds of things. The self-contained unit with a, with, a, uh, uh, with a generator on it. So we just need water and boom, we can show you how to do a lot of different things. Uh, that, that help, help you come up with some good products for the marketplace. Next. And so here are the, the websites to go look at louisianafisheriesforward.org. Uh, there's, there's a dozen really nice industry videos on there, Nat Geo quality. There's reams of fact sheets and information that we put together to help, uh, to help drive our seafood industry forward. You can also go see the direct marketing programs on louisianadirectseafood.com. And also you can go to uh, the Louisiana Direct Seafood Shop and go there and look at the products and see how that does. So, so are, that's, that's my presentation. Are there any questions? When do we eat, Thomas? <laughs> I know Jim knows about this stuff. He, yeah, he's had a lot of it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll second you on the gar. That's some good eating fish. Yeah, gar, gar is a uh, gar is going to get rediscovered again. It's happening, and you know, for the first time, I, I I went up into the the central part of the state, and and visited with the commercial fishermen there that catch the buffalo, the the uh, Asian carp and all that. I've never eaten buffalo, but if you go to Alexandria, that's what they want. They don't want catfish, they want buffalo ribs. And so there's a, there's a lot of undeveloped seafood uh, in this state that we could do things with, so. But we're just at the beginning of it. You know, we've been a commodity producer, raw protein that's shipped out to go to restaurants and further processing and all of that. But 
uh, it's, it's nice to see the interest and the things that we can do from the university to help people take an idea, a project, and bring it to the marketplace. Hi, Thomas. We had um, a question posted to the chat, and the question is, how are the shrimpers and fishers who typically rely on the Delta market adapting to COVID? Well, here's what's happened is that uh, they're all still selling direct. We're not having, because our market was shut down, we kept our docks, we, I say we, the port, in, uh, the port of Delcom kept their, uh, kept their docks open. So when a boat comes in, there's hundreds of people there waiting for them. I mean, that's, so it's, it never stopped. It never stopped. The demand for a fresh seafood off the boat is, is just incredible. Great. Well, I don't have any other questions in the chat right now. Um, if, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to, to call on you or whatever makes you more comfortable. Simone? Uh, Simone yeah, I have a quick question for Thomas. I saw that on most of the labels, which were beautiful, by the way, it said certified Louisiana seafood. Is that right? It, that's a distinction, right? That, that well, that's a that's a that's a program that the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries developed. So they have that that you can sign up for and be part of that program. And if you do, then and you meet the criterion, then you get to use that logo on your label. So that's where that came from. And there's and there's other ones like certified Louisiana, certified Cajun. There's different things that you can do that help market your products. You know, things to differentiate. Yeah, and the only other thing I want to add is I noticed at the bottom of, of one of your flyers, it was translated into Vietnamese. I know that you have Spanish and our friends at Louisiana Sea Grant have helped us with some access. And so we appreciate that y'all are, are going the extra mile to make sure that the information that you have is accessible to communities here in Louisiana. So thank you and, and please keep that up. Well, you're quite welcome. I might add that, look, if there's somebody out there that wants to work with us that we don't know about, yeah, you might have just learned that some of the things that we can do, uh, we're glad to work with anybody. Send them to us. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's what we do. We'll take them from where they are to bring them to that next level. Thomas, was your contact information on that slideshow? Oh, my gosh. No, it's not. <laughs> well, I'll, I'm putting some in the chat, and I'll be sure to okay. add it in the chat, too, if you're okay with that, Thomas. Put Thank your email you. directly. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions for Thomas. And for those of you that if you're not familiar with Zoom, there's a little chat button in the bottom center of your screen. And if you click on that, you can see the conversation over to the left. Uh, so Simone's posted um, some of the sites and everything that Thomas mentioned there. Um, so I think, are we moving on to the agenda, Simone? Are we turning over to Jesse next? Yeah, we'll turn it over to Jesse. It's up to her. She wants to take some time, or but we thought we could talk about next steps uh, with Coast. If um, I'm going to finish putting Thomas's email address in there, but I'm like, okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, it says it says I cannot screen share. I'm gonna transfer hosting duties over to you. Okay, Jesse, hold on just a second. And Thomas, we wanna thank you too for sharing all that great information with everybody. Well, you're quite welcome and, and please reach out to us. Uh, we've got a whole team at Sea Grant that this is what we do. Uh, with this and any other issues regarding policy or rules and regulations and commercial fishing and processing and all of that. So uh, we, we, if we don't know, we'll, we'll go looking for it. I'm going to requ request recipes to come with each of the packages. Some of those pictures looked so good. I'm hungry over here. Okay. So 
So for the COAST team, the members that are here, we wanted to just talk about um, moving forward with the program. And I know that's kind of been difficult. Um, a couple of people who are in the meeting right now have been to our usual meetings, like down in Dulac and Golden Meadow and things, and know that usually we're all standing around a map and circling and drawing on things and having conversations about what you would ultimately like to see, because that's where this is all going. We're going to ultimately build um, a project for the community. And so we want to work in partnership with the community, but of course COVID, that's kind of been difficult recently. And so as some of you may already know, um, we've been trying to find a way to kind of transition that digitally to where people can actually give feedback and make comments and do what we would you know, do what we would usually do in person and draw on maps. And so um, the team here at the Water Institute has found this really cool um, thing called Mapgenaire. And so I created this little sample of, this isn't going to be the exact one that you're going to do, but just a sample to show you like what it is and how it works. And so if you can, does everyone, can I just see like a show of hands? Can everyone like see it right now? Okay, cool. Um, so this one I just called branching. Oh, let me move this over here. And so when you start out with the coast one that we have, you're gonna go through just a couple of questions about like what's your name, um, your address, your email address, things like that, just some general information. And it's going to move on from there. And so you'll have like a little multiple choice question like this. And as you can see, this one zoomed in. Oop, not like that. This one zoomed in. And what I really wanna show you right now, because we've, we've done this once before and there was, I think a little bit of confusion with the, the points, lines versus polygons. And so I just kinda wanted to show you a couple of things. So you'll have all of these options on the coast page as well for points, lines, or polygons. And what it's going to ask you is the same things we've been talking about so far in the meetings, um, sources of threat. And that could be however you defined it. If you know, we had people point out like old oil and gas infrastructure that's kind of wrecking, like wreaking havoc on people's fishing nets, um, some that are still spilling oil, um, or places that flood, prone to flooding, you know, culverts jammed up and things like that. And so we're going to talk about sources of threat, places of value, again, however you define that, and project ideas. And so in each one of those categories, you'll have these three little options of points, lines, and polygons. So just to give you an idea, I can see the Water Institute right there. So that would be a good way to use a point. And if you click point, it'll just drag it. And I'll drag it like that. And then you'll have a little pop up. And on the coast ones, it'll say, like, what is this place? Because of course, we're not always going to know if it's something that locals know. And so I'll just say this is the water institute and then save. And you see it leaves a little dot. So then we also have lines. Let's say I wanna draw the bridge that crosses the river. That'd be a good way to use a line. And so a polygon would be a better choice for like a location. I'm not sure what this is right here, but let's just say it's like a cane field and you want to draw like a little box around that and click back where you started. This is my imaginary cane field. And so once you do that, you'll come to a little stop page like this. Um, I put that in there because I think there was a little bit of confusion at first about like there are no more survey questions after that. And so you'll see like survey stops here. And if you want to go back and add more things, I just put one of each right now, but you're more than welcome to put 
more than one of every category. And yeah, just put in a little description. Be as descriptive as possible. And I know I kind of like didn't zoom in that much, but we do ask that you like zoom in a little bit just because, you know, we don't want to like accidentally drop a pin in the wrong place or anything like that. And so I'll be sending this survey out to the entire COAST team and you all have my email address and most of you have my phone number. So by all means, feel free to contact me if you have any questions about it or you want me to like help walk you through it or anything. And Scott, I think that was actually pretty thorough. Does anyone have any questions about it? So Jesse, just you're gonna send this out to folks and we have another demo in case, like we have this electronically, right? For folks to, uh, if they wanna watch it again, we'll record a little something and walk them through it again. Oh yeah, for sure. That That's gonna be no problem. And yes, I'm gonna send this out, the Coast one out to the Coast team. So, so Jesse, um, just to explain to the people that are on it, this is our way of getting input from the community about important places and we want to make sure their their voices are heard so um please whoever's listening either now or on recording please if you have something you want to put into this system please participate yeah for sure because this is this is basically supplementary to some of the information that we've already gathered at community meetings but we're also going to use this, and this is really going to be what influences whatever we decide to build together. Yeah, and, and we can send out also, maybe do a, a little one page instruction booklet, kind of summarizing what Jesse went over on the presentation here. And, and like Jesse said, this is gonna go up. Some of you have done the spatial video trips where we went out, I know we did a couple boat trips, we did a couple driving trips but also the three mapping exercises where we did. So this is really gonna be just another, you know, a way to kind of continue that work as we're all in lockdown here. Yeah, and we do really wanna emphasize that um, project ideas can be whatever you think is necessary in the community. So far, some of the suggestions that we have, have had have been like, um, on Trumpers Row, as I'm sure many of you know, there's a sinkhole in back of that historic cemetery. Um, some people have suggested just like boat launches. And so again, that would be a good way to use a point. Just like drop a little pen where you think that would be useful. Does anyone have any questions? We're really excited about this. And I think, and I think we can per periodically, as we go through, as we get more and more results, we can post some of the the mapping results on the the Coast Facebook page, so people can kind of see some of the ideas that are coming out, which will really be part of our conversation the next time we all get together to discuss the project ideas. Whenever that may be. Exactly. Uh, Jesse, too, um, I think we want to ask some folks, um, it, obviously, we, we polled some folks on some things that they might be interested in hearing more about. And so um, if these webinars are helpful, um, or if you would like a different kind of discussion, we want to be able to make sure that we're addressing what folks are looking for, too. So um, we might get some more poll questions or see us going back to some of those polling questions now that we've done one or two of these Zooms to see how they're working out. Yeah, so keep an eye on our emails and Facebook page. Yeah. We did include those resources for um, Thomas and Louisiana Seafood Direct in the, um, in the chat, but we'll also share that on the Facebook page as well. Um, Thomas's email is in there and Dustin Davidson and Garrett's office also included his email as well. Um, I know Garrett has a newsletter that he puts out and he, he has some pretty funny uh, quips in there too, if you, if you read them all the way. So, um, and then Jessie included, of course, her email in case y'all have any questions to, that you want to send directly to her. Yeah. So, so Jim, you want to close this out? Oh, uh, well, we want to thank everybody that uh, participated. We hope you got 
some good information from uh, from this, and uh, it's an ongoing project. We hope to have similar uh, programs like this in, in the future. Uh, maybe someday we'll be able to meet in person again. Uh, that would be nice, but uh, we'll see how things go. Um, and again, if you, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us and, and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.